It's good to see you all today. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 15. We're looking at a series which we've entitled Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, Part 16. For those of you who are just joining us, the reason for that is we're looking at the wilderness wanderings of Israel. That's the reason for Naomi in the desert. And the first place that we looked at is Mara, where they rebelled in anger and bitterness against God because the waters there were bitter. And so as we look at our text today, we want to do a very quick review, looking at these 10 times that Israel rebelled in the wilderness. It's very important to understand what they were because every one of us faced the same tests. Every test that Israel faced, you at some point in your Christian life, you're gonna face that test. The question is, will you learn what God expects as the correct response, or will you on the other hand, respond the way that Israel responded? And after 10 times, God said, it's over, you're dead. And he killed them in the wilderness. Many Christians live the Christian life wandering through the wilderness. They never have the joy, they never have the peace, they never have the blessing, they never have all the good things that could be theirs because they spend their time rebelling against God. Ten points of rebellion, and we need to learn what they are, what they mean, how they apply to the Christian life because Paul specifically tells us in the New Testament that the things that happened to Israel happened to them so that we would learn a lesson, so that we would understand how God deals with his own people. Because God is not a namby-pamby, wishy-washy, Mickey Mouse kind of a God. God expects us to obey. He expects us to obey without complaining. He expects us to obey with cheerfulness and joy. He expects us to obey in faith, to walk with him, because he could have led them through the wilderness in just a few days' journey, but they took 40 years to go nowhere. And they died in the wilderness. Is that where you're headed? Are you headed into the wilderness? And perhaps you've been headed into the wilderness for 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 years. You've been a Christian, but you've been wandering in the wilderness. And you may be approaching death, even if you're younger. Serious issues as we look at these passages. Now, rebellion test number one. For those of you who are taking notes, rebellion test number one was rebellion against God's ordained leadership. That was test one, rebellion against leadership. Israel not only failed that test once, they failed it over and over and over again as we look at the rest of the 10 different failures. Rebellion test number two was bitterness and anger instead of faith at Marah. That's the passage that we're looking at in Exodus 15, verses 22 through 27. Marah means bitter. And we learn some very important principles from that bitter experience of Israel. Number one, first thing we learned was God designs pain in our lives to cause us to trust him. In other words, to to help us take our eyes off of temporal things that are on earth and look toward eternal things. The second principle that we learned here at Mara was suffering comes before blessing and pain comes before joy. If you're gonna go through the desert of suffering, remember there is blessing and joy at the other end, but only if you walk by faith. There are multiple passages in the Bible that speak of pain before joy. His anger endureth but for a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Or Jesus speaking in John chapter 16, verse 21 says, A woman, when she's in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Suffering before joy. The third principle that we learned from Mara is the walk of faith is essential to a productive and joyful Christian life. Friends, you will not have a joyful, productive Christian life until you learn to walk by faith. Because you know the life of this world is full of misery. 
and it's full of bitterness, and it's full of suffering. And unless you learn to walk by faith, you will never have the joy that God has promised is available. Walking, daily progress, daily accomplishment, proving that you believe by walking in confidence toward a goal that you can't see, but a goal which God has in his word promised to you. The fourth principle that we learned in the context of walking by faith rather than by sight was that walking by faith deals with heavenly rewards. It doesn't deal with your salvation. It deals with rewards. That passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight, is dealing with heavenly rewards. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, this is the very next verse, and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the Bema. That's where believers show up. That's not where the unbelievers and pagans show up. The judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive for the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it is good or bad. The judgment seat, where you receive a reward for the way you've lived here. People confuse that with the great white throne judgment over in Revelation chapter 20. But everybody in Revelation chapter 20, every one of them, read it carefully, every one of the people in Revelation 20 is thrown into the lake of fire. Every one of them is found wanting. There are no believers at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. The judgment seat of Christ, which Paul is speaking of here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that's where believers go when the rapture occurs and we are taken to heaven and we have the judgment seat of Christ to receive our rewards and we enter into that marriage feast of the Lamb while the tribulation is going on on earth and then we come back with him when a number of judgments take place. Satan's cast in the bottomless pit. You have the judgment of the nations uh, as in the Olivet Discourse over in Matthew chapter 24 and, and so on. But the Bema seat where we receive our rewards takes place at the rapture as soon as we get to heaven. He's going to be passing out rewards. When you get to the book of Revelation, you discover that until we get to the end of the millennium, there are going to be tears in heaven. Because we'll suddenly realize what we lost. The Apostle Paul talks about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. And he talks about how we're going to shine like stars and that the stars differ in glory one from another. You'll either be able to have a magnificent reflection of the glory of God to give him praise or it will be a diminished amount of glory that gives him praise. Not praise for yourself. Praise for him, the one who bought you. The one who enabled you the one who gifted you, the one who placed you on earth at a precise point in time, no accidents, the one who gave you opportunities to witness, the one who gave you opportunities to stand for Christ, and either you did or you didn't, and you compromised. The fifth principle that we learned from Mara is that failure to walk by faith is rebellion in the eyes of God. Mara, <laughs> the second thing that we learn out of this entire series of rebellions, and really rebellion against Moses ties in here with, Moses, with uh, Mara, the, the fifth thing, which is so essential to all of the tests and every test that you will faith, face, is that failure to walk by faith is rebellion in the eyes of God. Why is it rebellion? Because number one, he's commanded it. <laughs> So when you disobey the commands of God, you're in rebellion. Number two, you can't claim that you weren't able because he has empowered you by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Three, you know what he wants you to do because he has given you his word. So when you refuse to walk by faith for whatever reason, God says, that it's rebellion. And that's why when we look at Hebrews chapter 11, we see what an incredible premium God places on 
obedience. God expects us to walk by faith. The sixth principle that we learned from Mara is that every form of faith testing that any believer can face is found in Hebrews 11. Now, I did a, a quick summary of that a number of years ago, how each hero of faith gives an example of how to respond to that particular type of test. Every type of test that you can face is found and answered by one of the heroes in Hebrews chapter 11. They're all there. Every level, every type, every example that you need so that you have a hero of faith that you can look at and say, wow, that's a great example of the type of test through which I am going right now. It's found there. The seventh principle that we learned at Mara is that if you refuse to walk by faith, it is impossible for you to please God. If you refuse to walk by faith, it is impossible, not hard, it's impossible for you to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is, now look at this, we're back in that context of rewards again, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How do you live? It proves whether or not you're walking by faith. The second test at Morah was the refusal of Israel to walk by faith. And that's one of the ten reasons that God killed them in the wilderness. When you refuse to walk by faith, although you have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit, God is ticking off at least two things against you. Number one, your death. Number two, your failure to gain heavenly rewards. We're not talking about salvation. We're not talking about sanctification. We're talking about rewards. The context of Hebrews 11 is just like 2 Corinthians 5. It applies to rewards and it applies to us. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Okay, so there are many subcategories to the points of rebellion for which God killed the adult Israelites in the wilderness. But the key points in God's death sentence include failure number one, Rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. Failure two, refusing to walk by faith is rebellion against God. Walking by faith is a habitual lifestyle, and we need to learn that. So there are three takeaway lessons from the three subpoints of rebellion at Mara. Number one, having a bitter spirit is rebellion against God because it blames God for doing evil when he meant it for good. Number two, refusal to walk by faith and refusal to walk in the spirit is rebellion against God because that means you're walking in the flesh. Number three, refusal to accept the tests and disciplines of God is rebellion against God because God has the right to give us tests to see if we have grown spiritually or if we're stubbornly stuck in the mud and we refuse to move forward. So now we get to rebellion test number three. That brought us to the third instance of rebellion at the wilderness of sin. That's chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Again, uh, we saw that the concerns of the Israelites were totally carnal, selfish, self-serving, and focused exclusively on personal conduct. They failed test number one again. Of course, they rebelled against God's ordained leadership, And in addition to failing test number three. So what we saw was that they wanted good stuff to eat. That was the instances of manna and quails, which are connected together, though they have different points of rebellion as we look at each one of these. Now, some of the people God killed on the spot. He didn't wait for them to die in the wilderness. He said, you know, you guys are so bad, I'm going to kill you right now. They didn't get past test three before God started killing them. He killed them on the spot in the wilderness. We saw that that dealt primarily with one of the so-called deadly seven deadly sins, the sin of gluttony. By the way, how many of you remember when I preached on the seven deadly sins? Anybody remember? Okay, we remember. Okay, good. <laughs> now, I'm glad you just committed yourself. How many of you remember the mnemonic devices that I gave you? And how many of you can list the seven deadly sins? Think about it in your head. You don't have to say it out loud, but I just want you to think. How many of you can actually remember one of those mnemonic devices so that it's very easy. You know, I, I put together a couple little words so that you would be able, with the letters of those words, I gave you three sets of two words. With the letters of those words, 
you could remember all seven deadly sins. Anybody? See your hands? <laughs> oh, wow, there was one! Congratulations! Are you looking at your notes right now? <laughs> good for you! Very, very good. I'm very happy about that. At least one out of 5,000 people here in this gigantic auditorium remembers. <laughs> Let me remind you again. I'll give you the, the mnemonic devices. You know, folks, I may just give you a, a, a spot quiz one of these days, and I'll have some rewards. Back, you remember, we were memorizing something else, and I had people come up to the front, and they got some free books because they were able to answer the little quiz that I gave in church that day. So look, if a, get a piece of paper, write these little words down. It will make very easy for you to remember these sins, and every one of them shows up in the wilderness wandering, and God killed people for every one of them. You need to know what they are so that you don't fall into them, so that you can avoid the judgment of God. Here are your three little sets of words. Number one, gap legs. You know, the bow-legged cowboy. Like a little kid, first time in Texas, walked around on a ranch, and he couldn't believe his eyes, he said. But he was really into Shakespeare and into poetry. He says, behold, what manner of men are these that wear their legs in parentheses? <laughs> Gap legs. Another one that's very easy. Slap egg. Take an egg, slap somebody. <laughs> slap egg. That gives you the same set of letters, just arranged a little differently. But if you think that's, or how about glass pig with one S? G-L-A-S-P-E-G. -E Think of a glass pig. Those are easy things to remember. There's a technique I learned from memory from one of my professors at seminary years ago. He called it a budak, where each letter of B-O-O-D-A-K stood for some different theological principle that we were trying to memorize as panicky sem seminary students. So those are three. Now, here they are. I'll give you the one that, um, that spells out gap legs, and you can put the words together. Here they are, seven deadly sins. Number one, gluttony. That's the G. That's what we're dealing with in our text here. A is for anger. P is for pride. L is for lust. E is for envy. G is for greed. S is is for sloth. And by the way, folks, I made that up. That's a, a real original, the, the, those little budak things there. Because, uh, you know, I was having a hard time remembering them. I thought there's got to be a better way to do this. I learned a technique in seminary for memorizing stuff that doesn't stick automatically. You think the devil wants you to forget that? You bet he does. He doesn't want you to remember what those sins are for which God judged Israel and God killed people and God kills people in the church today. You don't believe me? Look over at 1 Corinthians. Some people were abusing the Lord's table. They were committing the sin of gluttony. They were coming into the Lord's table. And we have that coming up next week. I hope you're right with God. They were coming into the Lord's table. And some of them were gluttonizing and getting drunk. And then they weren't letting anybody else have any of the food. And there were people who were poor who were going hungry. Paul says... Some of you are sick, and some of you have died because of this. People, the sins of Israel are alive and well in the church today. Don't shrug your shoulders and think, it doesn't apply to me. It does. That's why we're studying this. So as we go through the ten points of Israel's rebellion, for which God killed the adults, see how many of the seven deadly sins you can spot because they're all there. Now let's look back at the quail and the manna. We've given you a little bit of this in the past, but let me read you that section again. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, and it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew was let, excuse, the dew that was that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, 
as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. Manna, what's that? For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. David tells us in the Psalms that manna is angel's food. Imagine that. What an incredible blessing. Wouldn't you like to have a bite of manna now that you know that? Would you like to taste it? <laughs> it was like coriander and honey. That's the best description they could give of it. Wow, angel's food. Now, some of you have angel's food cake. I hope you don't have the other kind. But anyway, uh, so the second part was hoarding, which was in verses 25 and following. Moses said, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather. Are they stupid or are they stupid? And they found none. Duh. And the Lord said unto Moses, this is how God looked at it. He said, silly people, I guess I didn't give them enough brains. I need to give them more brains. Is that what God said? Did God take the blame and say, yeah, it's really my fault because, you know, I didn't give them enough experiences in life so that, so that they'd be able to handle this really big test. How big is this test? Go out six days. On day seven, don't go out. Is that tough? I mean, like, uh, duh, I lost my calendar. You know, God gives us simple tests. He doesn't give you a gigantic test in trigonometry and algebra, which most of us couldn't pass. I know I couldn't. I don't even know what they look like. You know, like they say, trigonometry, yeah, I used to have one, but the wheels fell off. <laughs> the tests that God gives you are common, easy, ordinary tests, but it's a test of obedience, not rebellion. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, the Lord willing. And they found none. Listen to how God viewed it. The Lord said unto Moses, now you can't cut this any other way. So, oh, they made a mistake. Oh, well, I'll overlook it. It's no big deal. Listen to what God said. How long the next word is six letters long. R E F U S E. This was an act of the will. How long refuse ye? It wasn't accidental. God looked into their hearts, He knew what was in their hearts. There were people who doubted the word of God. God had told them what was going to happen. They doubted the word of God. How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? They thought they could get away with it. I think that some of you here think you can get away with it. This is charge three in the death penalty. You mean when they went out on Saturday to look for manna? Is a charge related to the death penalty? Yes, because it's a charge of rebellion. How long refuse ye to keep my commandments? Now, I need to take a little, uh, you know, sort of a quiz test, not a quiz, but uh, sort of an opinion test. Uh, how many of you believe the Bible is inspired? Please raise your hands. You all believe it. Okay, good. Bible's inspired. How many of you believe that it is inerrantly, confluently, plenarily, verbally inspired? That means all the words, all the letters, uh, are inspired, not just the big concepts. How many of you believe that God preserved his word? Yeah, we have God's word today, don't we? It's not a, not a mistake. We believe that. How many of you believe God never makes a mistake? Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad we're getting big shows of hands on this. Uh, how many of you believe that 
God means what he says. Oh, okay, we all do. If God gives precise instructions, you've all just said that he did, that you believe that every word's inspired. Jesus said, not a jot or a tittle shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled. A jot is a yod. That's the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. A tittle is a little foot that changes a letter from one letter to another. For example, there's the Hebrew letter tav, which is the last letter of the alphabet. It has a little foot that sticks off the side. It looks like sort of an upside down box with a little foot on the side. But you know, if you just leave the foot off, that's the tittle, and you just have a little upside down box, it's a hey. If you leave a little space, it's a hey. If you leave the little leg off, you've got a reish. If you stick the little leg to the side, you've got a reish vav. Jesus said, not a jot or a tittle shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Do you think Jesus had a pretty high view of inspiration? You bet he did. Now, if that's the case, and if this is the word of God, and if God has given it to you in your own language, and you can all read English, and he has given you commands in it, and given you the indwelling Holy Spirit to obey it, do you not think that he will hold you accountable for obeying it? And if you don't, do you not believe that he will hold you in rebellion? He did with Israel, and he killed them as he killed the Corinthian Christians. They were believers. There are only nine verses in 1 Corinthians that commend the church at Corinth. That's the first nine verses. The rest of that book deals with problems at Corinth, with sins in the church. And God killed some of them because they would not obey. They violated especially two very important things, moral purity, when you get to around chapter 5. They violated the Lord's table, both of which give to us beautiful symbols of Jesus Christ. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge, Hebrews tells us. At Corinth, Paul said, a man living in incest, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He was a saved man, but he was living in immorality. God said, I want the whole church to turn him over to the devil. Let the devil do a job on him. Let him learn what it's like to be disobedient before I kill him. He'll get to heaven, but everything he's earned in his spiritual life will be burned up. People, what we see with Israel applies to the church. Well, anyway, we saw manna and hoarding in verses 25 through 29, and we saw direct disobedience and rebellion. Hoarding not Merely wise planning is a very common sin among Christians, and that's a manifestation of the sin of greed, the sin of covetousness, which we saw is idolatry in the eyes of God. That's how God views, if you're greedy, if you're covetous, God says covetousness, which is idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. Colossians 3, 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. That's one of the sins for which God judges you. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us the covetous man who is an idolater, that man has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. We're talking about rewards. We're talking about inheritance. Doesn't talk about your salvation, but you're losing something, and you might lose your life for it as well. And that brought us last week to the death sentence after the wilderness of sin at Rephidim. It was at Rephidim that Moses struck the, a rock which produced water, and then it was also at Rephidim where... Uh, Israel fought against the Amalekites while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer as Joshua won the victory over Amalek. This was test number four. Test number four. If you're writing down the tests, this is number four at Rephidim. Now, notice several things about this. We find that as we go through, there are two parallel things that take place in the passage. Check how many times Israel questions the motives of Moses. 
And then how many times Israel accuses Moses of murderous intent? And they actually parallel it with God. Notice how many times Israel questions the motives of God and how many times thus Israel questions or accuses God of murderous intent. Can you believe accusing God of murderous intent? Now God was going to kill them, but it was because they had committed death penalty sins. Not because they were good. We're such good people and God has these bad ideas for us. How many times have you complained against God that way? I'm doing everything good. You know what's wrong with me? Do you remember the book of Job? Job was a righteous man. The Bible says so. God allowed Satan to come in and destroy everything he had, including killing his kids. His wife turned against him. God could have taken her out and then he wouldn't have that problem. But God left, her with, left him with his wife. And she said, curse God and die. How would you like to have a wife like that? But it says, in all these things, Job sinned not with his mouth. But then we get through the rest of the book until we get over to chapter 40. And through the rest of the book, we find Job had three so-called friends. And they talk to him about things that seem so obvious. God doesn't do bad things to good people. God only does bad things to bad people. Good people always get blessed. Good people always get the stuff. Good people never get sick. And that's what you get all the way through. And Job says, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. He says, I'd like to stand face to face with my Redeemer. You know, what's, what have I done wrong, Lord? What have I done wrong? I've been reading the book of Job recently in my morning quiet time. And it's painful. And you know, a lot of the verses that his friends give to Job, <laughs> we often quote, you know, when we're dealing with an issue. And I sometimes wonder to myself, is that really wise to do? Because the friends were telling Job things that God in the end says, only Job has spoken correctly concerning me. You other guys need to repent and have Job pray for you. Or I'm going to smack you too. Because you have not spoken of me that which is right. Job prays for his friends. Ever had friends like that? Yeah. How many times do we accuse God of murderous intent? They were trying to defend God's name, but God said, you don't have the bigger picture. You don't know what's going on in the angelic warfare. You don't know what's going on in the spiritual battle. And Amalek at Rephidim gives us an illustration of what the spiritual battle is all alike in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to try to move quickly through this because this is important. Exodus 17, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeyings according to the commandment of the Lord, and they pitched in Rephidim. And there was, guess what? Guess what they couldn't find in the desert? No what? Water. water. Have we been here before? There was no water for the people to drink. It's the same test, but in a different form. First, they had bad water, but at least there's some water there. Say, so maybe you can boil it and, you know, you know, make it percolate down the sides of some little cup that you put over, and then you can drink the clean water down at the bottom. There's bad water. Now we have no water. God is asking them a question. Haven't you learned the lesson yet? You know, God takes you through the same types of situations. There's a little variation to it. But God is going to teach you lessons. He has guaranteed that he is going to conform you to the image of Christ. And when you don't get a lesson, he's a very patient teacher. He'll take you through it again. And if you don't get that lesson, you know what? <laughs> He'll take you through it again. When you run through school, how many of you ever failed a test? No, we don't admit that, but yeah, okay. <laughs> failed the test. Did you still have to learn the material to pass <laughs> the course? Yeah. Had to learn the material or else you failed the course. That's where you get kicked out of the class and maybe get kicked out of the school like God took them home to heaven. We need to understand that let's pass the test the first time then you can move on 
You say, but I don't want a harder test. Well, that's what life's all about. You know, the Lord is, he's cutting away the bad stuff in your life. He's refining you as gold. And Job recognizes that in the book of Job. You know, he's trying me as gold. The assayer, he's got the fire into the pot. He's, he's melting that, that slag in the pot where all of the stone floats to the surface because gold is heavier than rock. And so rock floats on top of gold. And as the heat comes up and as all of that stuff comes out of the gold, the gold melts, goes to the bottom of the pot, the goldsmith takes the scoop and he scoops off the slag from the surface and throws it away until in the end he has pure gold and he can look into the gold and see a perfect reflection of himself and that is what God is doing in your life he's removing the dross so that in the end you will be as pure gold and as you look into the pot, or as he looks into the pot, he sees the image of Christ reflected. Dear people, that's what we're supposed to do, is reflect Jesus. Reflect Jesus. Just remember that when you're going through hard times. God wants you to reflect Jesus lessons over and over. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses. So here we go again, rebellion against leadership, and said, give us water that we may drink. See, that had worked the first time. I told you this last week. That had worked the first time, so I figured if it worked the first time, we'll do it again. The problem was the reason it worked the first time is because that was the first test. But now they should have learned the lesson and not gotten back through that test again the people thirsted there for water and the people murmured against Moses and said wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst same situation same accusation same rationale and same accusing murderous intent Moses that's what you've got Moses cried unto the Lord Moses does this each time you know, when you go through tough times, what does God want you to do? And Moses scratched his head and thought, how can I solve this problem? Is that what he said? No. So Moses decided to pull out all of his um, philosophy books and see if any of the philosophers had an answer to this problem. Uh, Moses decided that he would gather his own private army and go beat up a bunch of people. Is that what it says? What did Moses do? Moses cried unto the Lord. When you go through those tough times, when people are putting pressure on you, you know who can answer it? Moses cried unto the Lord. The Lord said unto Moses, Go before the people. Take with thee the elders of Israel. In other words, this is a team action. We're going to be seeing in this Rephidim incident that each time we have a crisis, team leadership is essential. Do you ever wonder why God appointed multiple church leaders and not just one, not just a dictator in the church? Because God has a purpose twofold. Number one, with the division of authority, and Moses is going to learn this lesson later as we get farther down, and Jethro, his father-in-law, comes to him and says, you know, you're wearing yourself out. You need some men who can judge different levels of different kinds of problems that you have here in the congregation. God has designed team leadership one is the final place where the buck stops but there's team leadership and God decides Moses it's time for you to take some leaders with you take the elders of Israel I want them to understand what's going on I want them to be visible in front of the people you're not going to be the only one up there in front if there's an attack coming it's going to be against the elders of Israel as well as against you they help divide the responsibility they help take the blame they help show cohesiveness under my authority because there are multiple levels of authority under God's authority. We've talked about the spheres of authority before. Take the elders of Israel with you. 
And thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Here's something the people will recognize. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. God said himself would stand there. You know when we get to the New Testament, and it's a very long study, but when we get to the New Testament, we discover that the member of the Godhead that was standing on the rock at Horeb because he was the rock, Paul says so, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, was Jesus Christ. The pre-incarnate Christ is the one who is standing with Moses at Horeb. Wow. Jesus said when he went to heaven, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth, and to the end of the age. Is Jesus with you? You can't see him, but is he with you? How many of you think Jesus is with you? Amen. Can anything bad happen to you if Jesus is with you that's outside the will and plan of God? Can it? No, never. You see, if you believe in the sovereignty of God, if you believe that you're his child, do you not think that a parent takes care of his children? That he loves them? That he provides for them? That when they go through the, the deep waters and the fiery trials or the lion's den with Daniel, or the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were their Jewish names. Is he not with you? Nebuchadnezzar gets off his throne and says, I thought we threw three guys in, but there are four in there, and they're walking around, and the fourth is like another son of God. Who do you think that was? It was Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, third member of the, of the second member of the Godhead. He's with you. If you've trusted him for salvation. Now, if you've trusted him for eternity, why don't you trust him for life? That's what all this is about. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. Now, you know, God didn't use the same type of answer he used before. What did he use the first time they had bad water? He said, Moses, I want you to do something. I want you, there's this tree over here. Get that tree, throw it into the water. You say, man, that doesn't sound very scientific. God's not trying to teach you a science lesson. He's trying to teach you a lesson of faith. It wasn't that this kind of tree had, like some of the liberals say, had some kind of a peculiar chemical reaction with the water, and uh, then the water became not so bad tasting and the people liked it better. <laughs> no, 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 no. God wasn't giving you a science lesson. God was giving you a faith lesson. But now God says, I'm going to do something different. You're not going to take a tree and pull it up by the roots and there'll be water at the base of the tree. No, I didn't say that. He says, I want you to go over by the big rock. I want you to stand there and I want you to hit it with your rod. You know, if you read some of the liberal commentaries, they say things like, well, the water was right there and it was about to burst through and Moses just made that little crack that was all that was necessary. He took his wooden rod and hit a rock with a wooden rod and that's what made it pop open. And so water came out. Listen, folks, if you believe that, you really believe that <laughs> in coincidences, like, whoa, a big rock in the middle of the desert, you hit it with a rock and water comes out, and that's what you were expecting? That's like people who believe in evolution. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe that there's a creator God who created everything in six, six literal days and rested on the seventh day. And the people may drink, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now I want you to notice several things. First of all, Rephidim occurred just before they reached Mount Sinai. It occurred before they received the law. That's very significant because it counts as one of the ten times of rebellion. They didn't have to have gotten the law first before they were in rebellion against God. A lot of people say, yeah, well, you know, because we have the Ten Commandments, therefore rebellion is only because we've got the Ten Commandments. No. These three instances happened before Mount Sinai. They happened before Moses went up into the mountain and got the law. 
And even when he was up in the mountain, I mean, he comes back down. And Joshua's with him, and 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 they say, you know, what's that noise we hear? Is it a sound of war? No, it sounds like singing. Whoever sings in war having dance songs in the middle of war. You don't do that. They came down and they found the horrors of the golden calf, and we'll talk about that as one of the places where Israel failed. And Moses takes the commandments, which had been written with the finger of God, and he smashes them. They were busy involved in fornication, immorality. God killed a bunch of them for that. In fact, God used some human instruments to kill a bunch of them for that. Did you know God uses human instruments also in killing people? Well, we'll get to that as we get to it. So what we find here, although it's before the law, it was based on light. Light that God had already given them concerning the true nature of God. That's what Paul precisely declares in Romans 1 through 3. Romans chapter 1 deals with the light of nature and all are found guilty. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, not Godhood, Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, creation reveals things about the Trinity. And Paul says, because everybody has access to that, no matter where you are in the world, you have access to the light of creation. You are therefore guilty. That's why God could count this as one of the sins that counts as the death penalty sin. Romans chapter 2 deals with the light of conscience. And Paul gets to the end of Romans 2 and he says all are guilty because all have a conscience. You know the right from wrong. God has placed a conscience into every person born on earth. That they innately no right from wrong. And every one of us has at some point in our life, and we all have done it many, 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 many times, violated our conscience. We knew what was right and we didn't do it. Revelation chapter 3 deals with the light of special revelation. So you've got the light of nature, the light of conscience, the light of special revelation from God, and Paul concludes at the end of Romans 3, again, that all are guilty. Now, you know, although later points of rebellion in the wilderness would highlight the law, God made it clear that man is by nature rebellious, and the law only adds to the condemnation under which man finds himself. So we should note well, the first three points of rebellion were before the law. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. In the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they to the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim. We're at Rephidim, where we're studying right now. They were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. So Rephidim occurs before Sinai. Therefore all are guilty. There is no man that has an excuse, even those that are not under the law. I'll just read you those three passages quickly. Our time is up. Light of Creations, Romans 1.18, I quoted part of it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And that word hold is a wrestling term. It means to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, which is the light of conscience. For there is no respect of persons with God, for as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. In other words, judgment on those who don't have the law. So Israel committed their death penalty sins, three of them, before we get to Mount Sinai. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, now listen carefully, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show in the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, oh, and you know you've wrestled with yourself like this, their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. 
some of you are probably familiar with this transgender kind of stuff that's going on and, you know parents telling their kids they can choose whichever quote gender they want to be and going through all kinds of chemical processes and surgical processes and just outrageous kind of stuff they're excusing what their conscience knows is sin and violating God's word Meanwhile, their thoughts accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. All those motivations that they have for writing their so-called scientific reports that say, well, it's okay and it really doesn't harm the kids and all that kind of stuff. They're going to stand before the creator God who gave them a conscience. They knew right from wrong, but they seared their conscience. Peter talks about that. And of course, Romans chapter 3 is... The, the light of scripture, which is very clear to us. Since Christ is the one who is savior and judge, the events at Rephidim give us further insight into his character, a point which Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 10, but we'll have to stop there for now. Our gracious heavenly father, we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. It's all interwoven, it's connected, and there are no mistakes. And if there are no mistakes, and if you are God who has given us not a bunch of vague, sort of wishy-washy kind of commands like be good, if you've given us specific things that you expect us to do, who are we to decide we know better than you? You made us. You created Adam in the image of God. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. You created a man and a woman, not some kind of a halfway thing. Father, we thank you that you are the creator God. And as our creator, we owe, we are bound to you for obedience. And Jesus Christ is our master. He bought us. He paid the ransom price. He paid the price for a slave. He bought us with his own blood. Our obligation is to obey him and to obey him precisely. So many of us think we can sort of obey him the way we want to think we want to obey him, when we want to obey him, if we want to obey him. And uh, we don't have to if we really don't want to because after all we can get away with it because everybody else seems to be getting away with it and we go on with that kind of idiot reasoning. Father, help us to be a holy people, a separated people, a people who love you because you loved us and because we love you, we obey you, not because we're merely afraid, though we should be afraid, but we obey because we love. You are our Lord, our God, our Creator. Jesus is our Redeemer and our Savior. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.